As we round the bend and head for home in the Victorian election campaign, let's bring in our political panel, uh, two people who will be with me on Saturday night, I'm, I'm pleased to say, former Liberal Party President Michael Kroger and former Labor Minister Stephen Conroy. Stephen, what's your sense of things? I'm hearing from Labor people there's a bit of anger on the on the booths in, in early polling. Is it is it enough to, to scare well, that... Labor in terms of its majority? No, look, I think Labor are very concerned behind the scenes. I think the, the, the trend over the last month or two uh, has seen the Liberal primary vote picking up. And given that Labor's primary vote was almost a record highs in the last election, you almost automatically have a Labor primary vote that's falling. So the question is not can Matthew Guy win the election. I think that is very, very unlikely there. The chances of him winning 18 are small. And once you take into account he's likely to lose a couple to the Teals, that means he would have to win 20 if he lost two to the Teals. So that's just not going to happen. But where the real danger for Labor is, is if it loses more than 11 seats and is forced into minority government. And Labor's got challenges on the Liberals taking their seats, the Greens taking their seats, possibly a Teal taking their seat, and right-wing independents taking seats in traditionally safe Labor areas. So, yes, I think Labor behind the scenes are privately very concerned about what could happen this Saturday. Michael Kroger, the, the challenge from Matthew Guy among many is that if, if we do get into hung parliament territory, most of the, the crossbench and new crossbenchers are not... The, of the side of politics that would would work with a, a coalition government? Well, let's hope it's not a green cross bench, uh, Kieran. <laughs> so, mate, uh, Stephen's right because we did poorly in 18 as a result of the blanket hostility of the electorate to allegations against us of bullying, treatment of women, the fiasco regarding Malcolm Turnbull's leadership change... Our brand was toxic in 18 and nothing Matthew Guy did could, could save us. We had problems in 14 with our federal colleagues because of the hockey budget, which he couldn't sell, quite frankly, and that damaged uh, Ted and uh, Dennis Napthine irrevocably. This is the first election in three where the state members have had clean air from our federal friends and the hope is that the swing is reasonably uniform, but it's not just in the western suburbs, which are the safe Labor seats. Uh, you, can, you can see the Labor vote dropping and you think, wow, that's great news for the coalition. But if it's predominantly in safer Labor seats, then that doesn't help us immensely. So um, I see there's certainly going to be a swing to the coalition. There's a swing against Labor. Uh, there is great hostility, not physically, but personally towards... Uh, Daniel Andrews, who I think has been an appalling Premier. Um, and, uh, you know, but as I said the other day, I think there's an undercurrent that I can't quite put my finger on. There is a hostility to a corrupt government and there are allegations of corruption swirling around Andrews and the government. How much that's going to affect the vote on Election Day, we don't know. It could be very, very significant, Kieran. And that could propel Matthew Guy forward uh, in, a, in a very large way, I think. Well, we've had surprises before. And you think back to 1999, for those of us old enough to remember, and, and Steve Brax and that surprise victory as a Premier was going for a third term. Maybe this is another surprise looming this weekend, Stephen. Yeah, look, I, I actually had coffee with Steve Brax uh, earlier in the week and we were talking about that exact issue, whether or not the, the protest vote. Uh, because there, there's this perception that the two PP figures are so, you know, 55-45, even right now, still 53-47, the natural assumption is, oh, Labor are going to win. I mean, these figures are now meaningless. This election, more than the federal election will demonstrate, that a 2PP count does not reflect uh, an outcome on the ground. So, I mean, if Labor are 53-47 ahead 2PP, why are we talking about going into minority government? That makes no sense. So you've got to throw away the 2PP. But 
the focus on it has meant that Victorians think it's safe to protest. And to the credit of the Liberal Party, mm -hmm. and I say that in a, a political sense, not any moral sense, they've decided that they can't, Matthew Gar can't sell ice cream in the desert. So all they're going to do is focus on punish Dan, make him accountable, don't let him get mm -hmm. away with it. All they're advertising is just attacking Dan Andrews. And that is having some effect. Mm -hmm. It's lifting their primary vote uh, and it's starting to drag down Andrews. Uh, but, Stephen, we're, Stephen we've got vote. this scenario, though. I, w I, I want to pick up on that and ask you about this because you've got the Liberals focusing on Dan Andrews, Stephen, but Labor's focusing on Dan Andrews as well. I, I don't really recall uh, one veteran in Victorian politics said to me the same thing happened in 99 with <laughs> Kennett and the Liberals focusing on Kennett but the Labor Party was focusing on Kennett too and yet we're seeing a, s a scenario here where in generally politics as you know Stephen if there's a vulnerability one side will target that person like you know Scott Morrison at the last federal election but the other side will won't have them on their posters and whatever else but this is not happening here. No, that's right. Matthew Guy is not. I've been to a, I've been to a pre poll. Matthew Guy is not uh, high profile on any Liberal posters. There is lots of pictures on Liberals uh, posters of Daniel Andrews. So there's no question their campaign, coupled with you know frankly propaganda from some newspapers in Victoria, uh, that are purely and simply trying to denigrate uh, the leader, and that is having an effect. So what you've, what you've actually got is that Labor uh, has chosen to tough it out. You know, the, the decisions that have been made behind the scenes, the, uh, the Premier's office are, are very much influential when it comes to the campaign nowadays. Uh, they've believed passionately that Daniel Andrews is still an election winner for Labor. Uh, and so they've made sure that the, the campaign is focused around Daniel Andrews. So, yes, uh, you're... Your source is right when they say both sides are focused on the same person. Saturday night will tell whether Michael Kroger, whether those yeah. tactics are successful or not. Yeah, well, Michael, what's your read on that? Because it, it's, it, it was jarring to me as someone who, who's covered a lot of campaigns and then normally if you've got someone being targeted as a weakness, the other side will pull them back because they get the same, they get the same polling. They pick up the same sentiment. But this, that's not happening here. Yeah, he's both their greatest strength and their greatest liability uh, at this stage. I mean, what people like about Andrews uh, is his perceived strength and his stability. Whether I agree with that or not doesn't matter. That's what people like about him. He's been a strong leader during the pandemic in the eyes of a lot of people and he's been a stable leader. Um, there have been no leadership challenges, no threats of that, no threats of resignation by him. He, he, he's, he's, you know, he's been strong and stable in the eyes of many people. But he's also been very brutal. He's also butchered a lot of his parliamentary colleagues, his ministers. Uh, he's politicised the public service. Uh, there were queries over what happened with red shirts, the car accident, his fall with his back, and now most of all the whiff of corruption that's, that, 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 that you know, is around the government because of these ICAC inquiries. So... Uh, this is what I say, I don't think you're going to know. I mean, you look at the 99 campaign, I well remember it, I was in London on the night and a friend of mine rang me and said, oh, it was a landslide. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. He said, no, mate, against us. So, so some of these results you don't know. And let's not lose sight of the fact, Kieran, that the polls have been wrong so often. And we keep repeating this mm. because yeah. Trump, they were wrong in 16. They're wrong about Stephen Marshall, uh, wrong about Jeff Kennett. Um, they're, they're, you know, wrong about Bill Shorten in 2019. They have been wrong on many occasions and that's because overwhelmingly voters are these days not telling pollsters exactly what they're going to do. So, as I said um, yeah. the other day, there's one thing I'm certain of, which, are the, which is there are going to be some shock results on Saturday night, which no-one will see coming, and that's because the undercurrent uh, is either incredibly mm. strong... Or it's not incredibly strong. So seats we might hope to win yeah. that we don't win, or or the other way around. And that's you know when a whiff of corruption's around, uh, you never know how deep it is, and you can't pick it till election night. And I'm very much, as I said, looking forward to having both of you on that panel. It's going to be a, a very interesting night as we look at the numbers come in, Stephen. One of the things that complicates 
the being any having any certainty around the polling, as Michael alluded to, they've got it wrong uh, quite a bit in recent times. But uh, I think the added complexity is the fact that the major party primary votes are so low, so the votes then splinter. Exactly, that's exactly right. I mean, if you look at all the published polling at the moment, uh, you know, both parties are on either 35, 36, 37. Uh, and that means that this will be one of the lowest ever uh, Labor Liberal or Coalition Labor uh, combined primary votes. It could be as low as 70%. Uh, and that would be uh, a symbol that the electorate are very unhappy. They don't like Matthew Guy. They're deciding they want to punish Daniel Andrews. Uh, and they're going to go right across the board. Greens, Teals, rogue independents. Uh, this, this, will be, this could be a long election night for all of us. So yeah. I hope we've got some hot chocolate and bickies lined up in the, uh, in the studio there, <laughs> Kieran. We, we do indeed. Uh, we do. It's a good setup. I can, I can vouch for that. Now, Michael, what, one thing I was really surprised about at our People's Forum during the week is that the 100 undecided voters, I thought they were largely, you know, a very fair sort of cross-section in terms of their questions, but really none of them wanted to look back. Uh, Victorians, Melburnians, it seems, want to move on from COVID and, and it's a future a future-focused electorate right now. Yeah, that's right. And if you saw that very interesting article in The Age yesterday where they had a poll of what issues concern people, 2% were voting according to pandemic response, which will be, you know, uh, which is not, not a big number. Most people focus on cost of living. I think 27% cost of living is the biggest issue, but there's a minimum amount the government and, or opposition can do on cost of living. Matthew, guys come out with a serious policy on public transport fares, which I think is biting strongly in his uh, in his favour. But, yeah, I mean, look, this this is what I say about 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 the Liberal Party going forward. You you political parties generally, you just you basically have to inspire people to believe that their best days lie ahead of them, that the best days of the state mm. lie ahead of them. And this is where the Liberal Party's yeah. focus now and into the future should be in the moral working middle class. The people with mortgages, the people driving a long way to work, the people yeah. who are under pressure in traffic jams with schools, you know, hospitals under pressure, etc., childcare centres, no places, etc., etc. You have to give people a belief that their best days are ahead of them. And that's where, if the Liberal Party speaks to the, the moral middle class, um, you know, and this is Michael Suker's seat, Alan Tudger's seat, Jason Wood's seat, mm -hmm. if you speak to the multicultural communities who are basically part of that large middle class... That's where the Liberal Party's future is. If Matthew Guy and his colleagues have spoken loudly to that group, then he's in for a very good result on uh, on Saturday night, as Jason Wood did in his seat, where he got a swing to him of something like three percent, because Wood yeah. engages better than anyone else with the with the um, with the um, you know multicultural communities. So um, you know, of mm. course, people want to believe. You know, the best days lie ahead of them. And that's why politics is still about, you know, leaders who provide some inspiration and some and some relief and some hope, yeah. Kieran. Stephen Conroy, yeah, this, that was a, so that, well, the way Michael captured it there, I think we've never seen a more stark example in a campaign than this one of that very point, that it's got to be future focused and people, as Michael put it there eloquently, that they want to think and believe that they're, the best days are ahead. Look, that's, I think that's a very fair call. Uh, the problem is that uh, Matthew Guy's message is, I want to give you a green controlled balance of power. Uh, so when the Liberals took a decision to put the Greens ahead of Labor in a key bunch of seats, that was an admission of defeat. They knew they couldn't win. So their vision for Victoria is a Green-led minority government. Uh, and that's just a humiliating position looking forward that Matthew Guy is promoting this weekend. And I, I think there's been a rebellion inside the Liberal ranks about it. I know that Michael himself on camera has expressed some surprise uh, at some of these preferencing decisions. But Matthew Guy, looking forward, wants to give Victorians Green-led minority government. 
I mean, that is a horrendous prospect mm. for the state of Victoria. With with Labor's vote now falling away, Stephen, and, and going for a third term, Daniel Andrews, it, it's been said that he wants to... He wants to secure the, the premiership again and and not be defined by the pandemic. He doesn't want his legacy to be defined by that quite terrible and difficult period in Victoria. What's your read on that? No, absolutely. I mean, this was a tough time for Victorians. I mean, we had the record, world record lockdown. I mean, uh, you know, it was, it was tough on families. It was tough on kids. It was tough on people locked away in aged care homes for this for their own safety. So, yes, uh, no one wants to be remembered for, for that. And, and Andrews has, you know, had a very substantial policy around, and people all snigger about this in a, in a national sense, level crossing removals. That was a huge factor in his victories going forward. He's delivered on it. He's got a bunch of signature mm. infrastructure projects that will come to fruition over the next two or three. He wants to see them come through. What he wants to be remembered for is making Victorians' lives easier, getting around the state, as well as all of the environmental initiatives, solar panels on roofs. That's what Daniel Andrews deserves to be remembered for, not we had the world's longest uh, lockdown. Michael Kroger, you would think uh, that the Liberals, if they do fall short, and we don't know, we could be in for a surprise. We could well see the, the Liberals successful Saturday night. Let's, let's wait and see. But, but, it, but if not, uh, you look back at the last couple of decades in your home state, it's, it hasn't been a, an easy time for the Liberal Party, which was, this used to be the, the, uh, the, the jewel in the crown for the Liberal Party, Victoria. Yeah, it did, of course. So if we don't win on Saturday, well, I've only had one win since 1996 uh, at a state poll, and that was one in the last couple of days in 2010 when no-one thought we were going to win. So, no, it hasn't been a good record uh, whatsoever. I'll, I'll, you know, perhaps reflect a bit on that, more on that on Saturday night. But, um, you know, as I said, I think, I think in politics today... Um, people are under so much pressure, uh, more pressure than I, than I think people have ever been under. Um, uh, in, their, in their lives. And there are a hundred reasons for that. Whether it's the technology revolution, which is threatening people in old economy jobs, uh, whether it's people driving trucks who fear, who fear in, in innovation, um, you know, whether it's people in churches who see religion declining, whether it's people uh, who, who are trying to get kids into childcare and there, there are no workers, whether it's people in the hospitality sector that can't find wait staff in, in restaurants, whether it's live music venues, I mean, you know, higher interest rates, uh, you, you know, there, there are kids leaving school, kids getting into university, the pressures of university. I think there are more pressures on people to succeed uh, than I've ever seen in my life. And as I said, that's why, you know, a really successful leader, a really successful government, well, government, that is, Premier, Prime Minister, will, will lead people to believe that they do have serious answers, that they are credible, that they will show people a path, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to get there. And that's why, that you know, being political for a minute, the $275 pledge by Albanese to cut, uh, you know, electricity costs, it, it's going to play so badly for him because people just realised it was just a, you know, a reckless statement he made with, with, no, with no real, you know, science behind it. And so leaders have to be credible. I mean, Hawke was a powerful, credible leader. You could believe what he said. He didn't make reckless predictions. Uh, Howard, the same. Um, you know, Keating and Costello, you know, great treasurers in, 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 their, in their different ways. Um, you know, the successful leaders are those who take people with them, inspire them and tell them where they're going and take them there. And as I said, give people a belief that there are better days ahead of them. And that's the great challenge for the Liberal Party, as it is for all parties, mate. Michael, Stephen, gentlemen, great to see you. We'll see you Saturday night. Looking forward to it. Look, look forward to it, mate. See you there.